Hello everyone, my name is Jonathan David and I'm a barrister at Brickcourt Chambers in London practicing in commercial litigation and arbitration. As usual, everything I say today is my own personal view and doesn't necessarily represent that of other members of Chambers. I'm going to look at some issues surrounding permission requirements for expert evidence under the CPR. By reference, to a recent CMC judgment of Mr Justice Andrew Baker in Burford Capital Limited and London Stock Exchange PLC. As you'll be aware, expert evidence is governed by Part 35 of the CPR. Rule 35.4 brackets 1 states that no party may call an expert or put in evidence an expert's report without the court's permission. Usually, permission for expert evidence is dealt with at the first CMC. But what if you need to put in expert evidence before a CMC has been held, either in support of an interim application or, as was the case in Burford, as part of a claimant's evidence in a Part 8 claim? Under CPR Part 8, the claimant has to file its evidence with the claim form, so clearly you can't get permission in advance. It would be fair to say that the courts have not been particularly consistent in how they've applied Rule 35.4 brackets 1 to such situations. In the case of BB Energy Gulf DMCC versus Al Moody, on a jurisdiction challenge, Mr Justice Andrew Baker criticised the parties for not having sought permission for expert evidence under CPR Rule 35.4. He stated that permission was required for interlocutory hearings as much as for trials and he emphasised that this was not a pedantic procedural concern on the part of the court because the failure to seek permission had resulted, as he put it, in the exchange through service and counter-service of evidence of an escalating volume of material not always addressing the same questions or analysing the case for the questions to be addressed in a consistent fashion. And this statement was cited with approval by John Kimball QC sitting as a Deputy High Court Judge in Gulf International Bank BSC and Oldwoods, neutral citation 2019, EWHC 1666, brackets QB. On the other hand, in Roman Pipia and BGEO Group Limited, an application for security for costs, the applicant had sought to rely on expert evidence of foreign law in the form of a memorandum annexed to a witness statement without having first sought permission under CPR Part 35. Mrs Justice Mulder held, at paragraph 23, that in the context of an application for security for costs, a flexible approach is required, and, in the circumstances of such an application, it is not just or proportionate to require expert evidence to be adduced which complies with the rules on expert evidence. In reaching this decision, Mrs Justice Moller took into account that the test she was applying was that of a real risk that a costs order would not be met, rather than whether that was more likely than not. The hearing of a Part 8 claim, though it will rarely involve oral evidence, is nonetheless a trial. On the other hand, Burford's claim was for Norwich Pharmacal Relief, for which the evidentiary threshold is that of a good arguable case rather than a balance of probabilities. So is permission for expert evidence required in such a situation? In the Burford case, there were four rounds of evidence. In the first round, Burford did not serve a separate expert report, but annexed a report to its main witness statement, in other words, the same approach as had been taken in Roman Pythia. The Stock Exchange, in response, also did not serve an expert report but it responded to Burford's expert through the body of a witness statement where the witness in question was an employee who claimed to have the relevant expertise. And then in reply, Burford had used expert evidence in the form of a PD35 compliant report with the Stock Exchange's further response again being in the body of a witness statement. Thus, the situation was that the court had before it expert evidence in three different forms as an annex to a witness statement, in the body of a witness statement, and as a standalone expert report. To what extent was permission required for any of this 
under CPR Rule 35.4. Burford took the view, in light of the BB Energy decision and out of abundance of caution, that it was appropriate to seek permission under CPR Part 35.4, albeit retrospectively, both for its annex and its standalone expert reports. The Stock Exchange, while not opposing permission being granted, suggested that it was not necessary, a la Roman Pipia, albeit that it also complained that Burford had been disorderly in not seeking permission in advance. A somewhat contradictory submission, one might think. Neither party took the view that the Stock Exchange required permission for its own witness statements, notwithstanding that these contained what was, in substance, expert evidence in response to Burford. The application was heard by Mr Justice Andrew Baker, the same judge as in BB Energy. Perhaps surprisingly, given the trenchant terms of the BB Energy judgment, at the outset of the Burford hearing, the judge questioned whether permission was required under CPR 35.4 in circumstances where the relevant test being applied was that of a good arguable case. By the end of the hearing, however, the judge had come around to the opposite view. Not only was permission required for Burford's expert evidence, but it was also required for the Stock Exchange's witness statements insofar as they dealt with expert matters. In reaching this decision, Mr Justice Andrew Baker had regard not only to CPR Rule 35.4, but also to Rules 35.5 and 35.10. Specifically, while CPR Rule 35.4 brackets 1 requires the court's permission for a party to call an expert or put in evidence an expert's report, CPR Rule 35.5 brackets 1 requires that expert evidence is to be given in a written report unless the court directs otherwise, and CPR Rule 35.10 brackets 1 requires that an expert's report must comply with the requirements set out in Practice Direction 35. As the judge analysed it, therefore, permission could only be given under CPR Rule 35.4 in respect of expert reports themselves compliant with Practice Direction 35. And on the material before him, that was only applicable to Burford's responsive expert evidence. Because Burford's initial expert evidence had been annexed to a witness statement and was not in the form of a PD35 report, Rule 35.4 didn't apply. Instead, for Burford to be able to rely on this initial evidence, what was required was a direction under CPR Rule 35.5 brackets 1 permitting expert evidence to be given other than in the form of an expert report. Perhaps the most important aspect of the judgment was that Mr Justice Andrew Baker determined that this was equally true where a witness of fact gave what was in substance expert evidence and that the Stock Exchange therefore also required a direction under CPR Rule 35.5 brackets 1 to be able to rely on its witness evidence. It remains to be seen how far this approach is applied by other members of the judiciary, but it has potentially far-reaching consequences. It is not at all unusual in cases involving expert evidence for factual witnesses, who are themselves experts in the field, to express opinions that properly fall within the domain of expert evidence. For example, in a professional negligence claim, it's commonplace for defendants' witnesses to say why they thought the defendants' actions were appropriate and competent. Adopting Mr Justice Andrew Baker's approach, such evidence is formally inadmissible unless a direction is sought under CPR Rule 35.5 brackets 1 for permission to adduce expert evidence other than in the form of a PD35 compliant report. In practice, however, one suspects that this will only be enforced in those rare cases where a party wishes to rely on an internal witness in lieu of an independent expert, as was the case in Burford, or where there is a transparent attempt by a witness of fact to usurp the role of an expert. Thank you for listening and I hope you'll be back soon.